Now, hi everybody. The stalwart followers of First Thought here for the very last event uh, of this year's program. Uh, and we're hoping that next year it'll be all back to normal again and we'll be in the Isle of Max and there'll be people fighting for tickets and it's all going to be lovely. Um, we're very delighted. Well, first of all, you're all wearing masks. You will continue to wear those masks during the, um, the event. Uh, we present these events in conjunction with our education partner, NUIG, and we're very grateful to them for their assistance, not least for giving us this lovely venue. Um, we're delighted to have, he'll be here in a minute, uh, Mike Ryan, who all of you know because you've been looking at him and listening to him for the last 18 months. Uh, if you hadn't heard of him before, you certainly <coughs> have now. And of course, one of his main themes is vaccine justice. None of us is safe till all of us are safe. He's going to be interviewed by Paul Cullen, who some of you might, might have been here for earlier, where he did a wonderful interview with Theresa Lamb. He's health editor of the Irish Times. He's been there since 1993 as a journalist. And he has given us some of the best informed, coherent and useful writing on the pandemic throughout the period there. And we all needed that sort of reassurance that we were listening, reading somebody uh, and listening to him sometimes uh, on, on everything we needed to know about the course of the virus itself, the measures being used to combat it, progress of the vaccination program, the relationship between the government and NEFIT, which is still complex. And there will be a book written, I'm sure I presume somebody from Neffet will write a memoir someday to tell us exactly what went down with all those interesting things. Or somebody will make a movie and we can all cast them now. Who'll play Tony? Who'll play Ronan? <laughs> who'll play Philip? Um, who'll play Stephen Donnelly, indeed. Um, and of course, a huge toll was taken on lives and this was a global, once in a lifetime historical event. None of us ever thought we would live through something like this. Neither did people in 1918 when the Spanish flu hit them, when they had nothing like the amount of uh, tools avail available to them that we have now. So Paul has been telling us all of that and uh, keeping us from being too frightened by putting judicious admixtures of hope and optimism into the bad news that he had to bring us every now and again. Um, so uh, please welcome Paul Cullen. And eventually, and here he is, Mike Ryan. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Enjoy yourselves. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and a great pleasure and a privilege for me to be interviewing Mike Ryan. Um, and as, as you all know, I don't really need to say it, he is an epidemiologist. It's also a trauma surgeon. Weren't you, Mike, uh, uh, originally training to, to do that? In, in training, uh, ne never quite made the grade. Yeah. It was a, one of those twisty turns in life that happened. Yes, and we might hear more about them in a while. Because over the last 18 months, of course, Mike has become a really familiar face uh, as the head of the World Health Organization's emergencies program, uh, leading the team responsible for containing and controlling uh, and treating COVID-19. And there was a time, as you know, uh, when you couldn't turn on a TV screen without seeing Mike's face being beamed around the world. Um, he's from Curry, not a million miles away from here. It's a townland near Tubber Curry in County Sligo. And he grew up across the county border in Charlestown in County Mayo. So he's kind of split loyalties there. Uh, he trained here in medicine in NUIG. And um, he also has a master's in public health from UCD and qualifications along a similar line in, from the UK. But he was always adventurous and he went to Iraq in 1990 to train their doctors there and, and, and probably got a little bit more adventure than you bargained for at the time. <laughs> um, they included uh, some injuries in a road accident which forced a change of direction in your career, Mike, and, and that was to make a big difference to the world. In, in 1996, he joined a new unit in the WHO devoted to infectious diseases. And since then, he's worked for many years in the field fighting the outbreaks of, uh, of some of the world's worst diseases like Ebola, SARS, cholera, dysentery, and many, many others. Uh, I wrote about him um, early last year. I'll quote it anyway. I thought it sums up things. He said, in an eventful career, he's been held hostage in Iraq, buried bodies to stop contagion in West Africa, and faced down guns just about everywhere, even in the operating theatre. So he left the WHO, probably thought he was going to have a quiet life back in Galway. Uh, but he, from here, he continued to work on polio eradication and other projects. 
But then he got the call and he went back to Geneva, this time to work in headquarters in the WHO. And faithfully for all of us, he's become intricately involved in the pandemic uh, over the last 18 months. Um, I was going to start, Mike, um, by pointing out the fairly obvious that you've had more adventure in your, in your life than the early 21st century would normally allow any of us. Um, I mean, you're the son of a uh, merchant seaman who unfortunately died when you were young from a small, very small townland village in, in the west of Ireland. You ended up in Africa, as I said, burying Ebola victims. Now you're running the fight against a global pandemic from Switzerland. So I'm just wondering, was this always destined for you? Were you always drawn to travel and to adventure from an early age? Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. <laughs> we started for <at> ten, <laughs> and uh, and uh, thanks to the arts festival for for so kindly uh, inviting me. Yeah, no, I I grew up on on stories of you know Pacific islands and uh, sailors and and exotic places. Uh, uh, as a kid, uh, my grandmother had a. Uh, uh, her front room was a sort of an altar to uh, my father's travels. And uh, I remember um, my uncle in the States in Chicago uh, got a, a, a lifetime subscription to National Geographic for my granny. And I used to remember going down every single month and sitting in her front room and just opening these. You, know, you remember the old, um, it's probably electronic now, but the, the old uh, paper version of the National Geographic with those high resolution photos. and. Yeah. It was just a world I lived in as a kid. So I lived in a small village in Ireland physically, and I sort of lived uh, uh, an ulterior existence in uh, globe trotting uh, virtually in my head uh, with stories from my dad and, and the National Geographic. Yeah, I, I wonder, are you one of those who owe a debt to Don O'Malley? I mean, were you the first in your generation, in your family, to go to college? Is that, does that form part of your identity as well and, and, and your Absolutely. belief system? Yeah, tell us about that. No, I'm definitely I'm the, I'm the first person uh, in my uh, the the we are the first generation, and I was one of obviously the oldest uh, the oldest uh, grandchild uh, on 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 my uh, on my Mayo side as well. Uh, so we were the first generation to go to to, to go to college, um, and it's we do we do owe a massive debt to that previous generation, the generation that the sort of. Uh, I, I, I feel, in a sense, the connection I have with my grandparents, who were pre-Civil War, pre-War you know, War of Independence, they went through that. My, my grandfather was, I think, the, the first contingent of Gardaí uh, who qualified and marched out of Griffith Barracks in whatever it was, 1922. Mm -hmm. So I have that connection there. And what that generation, those two generations went through, uh, after independence to, in the state, and then the acceleration of education in the 60s and in the 70s. Uh, my dad left school, I think, at seven or eight years old and uh, was sent to live with a, an uncle in Galway who didn't have any male children and, and spent most of his life as the sort of adopted son of a, of, a, of, a, of a farmer and then sort of ran away to sea at the age of 14. I think he forged his birth cert to, to join the Merchant Navy. So that would have been the experience of that generation of people who did the most big, really, we owe them and we owe the politicians at the time who put in place you know, a, a system that allowed me, I would never, ever, ever have had the education I had without that having happened. Uh, so we do owe a huge debt. Uh, to that, to those two generations in particular, you know. Yeah, and where did medicine come into it? Did you always want to be a doctor, or? Um, I think I wanted patient? to be. I think I wanted to be a sound engineer, uh, a band <laughs> manager. I'm uh, oh, sorry, we uh, already have a, a, a well-known doctor around here who plays guitar. We, 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 that's taken. <laughs> uh, sort of somewhere between that science. and a marine, a, a marine biologist. I thought because I love science, and I was obviously had my dad's genes for the sea. Uh, but uh, something sort of struck me about medicine, uh, and I think in many ways too. I think my dad always wanted to to be a medic. Uh, he he said he used to say to to me as a kid, as a young boy, that he had gone to the University of Life, but he was going to make sure that his kids went to university. Uh, and uh, I didn't know what he meant at the time, but uh, after his passing, I really understood what it was to attend that University of Life. So um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 medicine for me. 
uh, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't something I was obsessed with in school. I was more obsessed with playing football. Uh, and uh, any good girls than I was in 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 study. I was Were you any smart. good, Mike? Uh, what? No, I wasn't that good. I was good enough. Good enough to play club football. I'm told you can move mountains, so I mean, yeah, I, can yeah. move mountains. Yeah, I still follow my my club curry at home every weekend. It's interesting, but it's been a huge development in my life that now with Facebook and everything, you can live stream games at the lowest mm. club level in Ireland. So you'll find me live streaming curry GAA club more than live streaming Netflix. Uh, so um, no, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's. Uh, Medicine was something I I, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I had a fantastic upbringing. Medicine kind of grew on me. Uh, and then once I had captured that, I had a fantastic science teacher in school, maths teacher. Yeah, was talk about that. yeah, yeah. you got a leg up um, from some really good teachers, didn't you? Yeah, and th it was that sort of, that enthusiasm and that fascination that they had with science. And, you know, it sort of hit me. And I was, I was, I was a smart enough kid not to have to do too much work. Uh, uh, and uh, that was always a, an advantage, but uh, but then I always I had a mum who made sure that we got our heads done. So I had the advantage of having a sort of a free life, but uh, that influence that would push us towards getting our work done. So somewhere in that balance, uh, I made it into medicine. Sure, and you, you are where you are now. But obviously, the last twenty twenty one months has been really tough on many many people. But you're in the public eye, obviously been. I imagine pretty tough from you, for for you, and even though you found yourself in some pretty difficult situations in the past, I mean you've been put into a very pressurised situation. A lot of yeah. focus on, on on your every word, um, and there've been many of them. It must be taking a to its toll. Or do you wear it lightly? Uh, I tr I try to. Uh, I've got a great team of people working with me, uh, and they you know they keep me between the ditches. Yeah. Um, I do know. I mean, it, it, it's slightly uncomfortable to be quite honest, Paul. To, I'm getting so, it over early. Don't worry. I won't, I won't do it for the full hour. No, but no. I think we're in the west of Ireland now. I think they want to hear about the local man. Yeah. No, but you, you, you spend the first 55 years of your life in relative uh, and glorious anonymity. And even within the medical world, yes, I'd be known by some people. Yeah. So it is quite difficult then to manage the fact that you become a kind of a, a minor celebrity. Uh, at, at, at this age and have to engage uh, so much in, in, in public, with the public, through the media and others. And, and on the one hand, it's been fantastic. On the other hand, it's been terrifying. I often say to people what our global press conferences, which I think we're nearly at 200 now, that every time you open your mouth, it's a career-ending opportunity, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been a big failure on that score. <laughs> Mike, uh, two years ago now, before this is before the pandemic started, you were interviewed by a, a US health website and they called you the fireman of global health at the time, which turned out to be pretty true, I suppose. Um, and you were, you were concerned about Ebola at the time. As, as I know, it's close to your heart, if you can use that expression, about a horrible disease. Um, but you were quoted as saying, it struck me, this quote, um, if we can't stop Ebola, what hope do we have of stopping disease X? <laughs> And that was about three or four months before Disease X arrived, really, isn't it? Um, was that, uh, did you have a crystal ball in front of you there? Or is that, uh, that was an inevitability, was it, that we were going to face this at some point or another? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm not the first or the only person who said that. That, that journalist was the great uh, Helen Branswell at Stack Very News. Very good, isn't she, yeah. yeah, like, yeah. like yourself, Paul, an, an excellent... Uh, scientific and health uh, reporter and correspondent and journalist. Um, yeah, it was, um, it, it, for me, the issue, well, having gone through SARS the first time around, having gone through the pandemic in 2009, with the history of infectious diseases that we've uh, faced with the eradication of smallpox, um, the struggle at that time was we were struggling to contain a disease that really only spreads from person to person by body fluids. Uh, but we were doing it in a in a in a in a massively dangerous environment, in, in the middle of a of a multi-phased, multi-faceted, uh, almost a, a constant warring uh, situation, mm. with the population, you know, fifty years in that situation, very distrustful, very difficult to contain a disease in that environment. And I was probably saying, if we can't get this done, uh, what will we do? when we face a respiratory pathogen that's efficient in transmitting between people and likely by the respiratory route. Um, and it was at that sense uh, at, at the time. 
Um, I, I do remember, you know, being in New York at the UN General Assembly in 2019, and we were we were launching a, a global report on preparedness. And I remember standing there in front of that audience saying, well, you think the next big one is going to be somewhere in Congo or somewhere in the South, somewhere in the developing world. But, you know, the next pandemic will affect everyone. And on that particular day, I think we had, you know, we were up to, you know, thousands of cases of Ebola. And I said, what would happen in New York here? If you had two and a half thousand cases of Ebola, I said the city would come to a stop. This wouldn't just affect the health system. This would affect the economy. This would affect social order. This would affect everything. And I think that was always our, our great fear that we were just, you know, a bit, a bit like the climate crisis. It's that sort of sort of staring into the distance and and seeing something, but you can't quite define it. And we do that as human beings because we deal with proximate risk. That's what we need to do. We're hunter gatherers. We're not worried about next year's hunt. We're worried about today and getting food on the table. So we're programmed to deal well with proximate risk, the risk that's in front of me now. We tend to to discount risk that's in the future because it's not relevant to my life right now. The problem is if that's discounted at a policy level all the way up through society into governments and in the multilateral system, then you're going to get whacked later. And I think we're sort of sleepwalking our way into the pandemic as we're sleepwalking our way through the climate crisis. So does that mean that this crisis could have been avoided? Um, avoided probably not in the sense of will, will there always be a threat of pandemics? Absolutely, yes. A, a respiratory pathogen emerging and transmitting between humans has been part of human history. And you go back to Justinian plagues, whatever but um and as we look for the origins of this virus you know the most likely source is probably a wild animal intermediate host from a bat that was either farmed or caught in the wild uh, and then was passed into the the human system the human food or human medicine chain and 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 sparked a, a pandemic the chances of that occurring are constant we're exploiting um pristine environments we've got a tremendous trade in wildlife, most of which is entirely illegal. We've got an international transport and trade in these in these animals. Um, and we've got very weak biosecurity measures in those systems. Uh, so there's always the risk that we're going to be in that situation. We've got the avian, the next pandemic is probably unlikely to be SARS, COVID. It's, it's, it's much more likely to be another influenza strain, another avian strain. Uh, so those risks, uh, always occur. The issue is, are we, are we using the opportunities to reduce those risks by proper management of the, the biome that we live in, proper management of the environment, proper management of, the, of, of the, the biodiversity that we have, and reducing the opportunity of those diseases breaching the barrier into humans, and then reducing the risk of those diseases amplifying in humans, either in unsafe, unsafe healthcare systems, in markets and other places. So for, for me, the risks are around emergence, which we're driving. They're around amplification in those settings, you know, in, in a slum, in a refugee camp, in a poorly managed hospital, and then propagation or dissemination through our international transport system. Those three big risks of emergence, um, uh, amplification, and propagation, the natural world didn't create those risks. We've done it. Human behavior, human society, human commerce, uh, has driven those risks. And we've done very little to manage or mitigate those risks in terms of preventing them happening. And clearly, in response to this pandemic, we didn't have the architecture in our health systems to take the, to take to absorb the impact. We didn't have the architecture in our systems to be able to develop enough vaccine and distribute it quickly enough. Huge scientific um, success in developing diagnostics and in developing vaccines in the fastest time in history, yeah. but we've fallen short of the mark by not distributing them equitably. Yeah. Uh, be that as it may, I mean, different countries and different parts of the world responded in different ways. We obviously had the New Zealand model. We, there was talk of a Swedish model back then. There's the messy European way of doing it. Um, did any of those work better than any other? Or has it all come down to roughly the same sort of, are we all in the same place now finally? Or has any been shown to be superior and that we could learn from, from in the future? Um, I think there's a number of countries, particularly in Asia, 
ones you've mentioned that managed to keep a really tight lid on this virus for a very prolonged period of time. But it's like any endeavor like that. Suppressing a virus involves ultimately in this situation a respiratory pathogen suppressing societal activity, mobility and all of that. And there's a trade-off between suppressing that virus and the tolerance socially in a society, economically in a society, to be able to, 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 to continue that. Uh, well, the hope was that by suppressing virus transmission, we would get a much more, uh, we would get a rapid increase in vaccine coverage, which we're seeing. Uh, and when you look at the overall incidence of disease in some of those Asia, in South, in Asia Pacific countries, they're now getting higher and higher vaccination levels. And when you look at their numbers, their numbers are quantums less than the numbers of cases and deaths that have occurred in Europe and in, in the Americas. So in that, but many of those countries have, have, you know, have had to do catch up. We've seen in Australia, we've seen in Japan and other places, they've now tried to catch up their vaccine coverage to get the actual benefit of having suppressed the, the virus transmission. Because if you keep your, if you keep your, your, your boot on the, on the neck of the snake, uh, at some point, the snake is going to bite you back yeah. uh, unless you vaccinate. Uh, and vaccination was always going to be a huge part of this strategy. Mm. The problem in, in, in many countries, particularly in the industrialized countries, is that we had completely unmitigated transmission. And then we were trying to develop a vaccine in the middle of that process while our health systems were collapsing, while our, you know, uh, yeah. all around us. Yeah. So there's no model that's perfect because... It, 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 it's about having a, you need a game plan and you don't play the same kind of football in the first half as the second half, you know, and that's the point. What we and need then is... the variant a, a came along, the Delta variant as well, and that's, that's made it tougher for some of them, hasn't it? It has, no, and there's yeah. no question. The Delta variant is, is much more transmissible. Uh, and in a sense, that's, uh, that's introduced, uh, it, but like in every epidemic, there's, and in any situation in life, there's always a sidewinder. There's always something that happens that you don't predict. Uh, and we, you know, we we were tracking variants from the from 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 the outset. We had the alpha, the beta, the, and then we're up to, to delta, and we have other variants of, uh, of of interest. The fact is, the virus is under is under intense uh, selective pressure, uh, and 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 those viruses that can transmit more quickly uh, and more effectively survive, and the others uh, that don't tend to die out. So it's an evolutionary uh, uh, arms race between the viruses. Uh, and uh, the, there is a lot of evolutionary pressure on the, on the viruses to develop increased transmissibility. Mm. It's not so much in terms of developing increased lethality. It's not, it's not a pressure that's on the virus from a selection point of view. It's a random effect. The, the pressure on the virus to become more transmissible is not random. It's an actual pressure. The virus has been driven in that direction because the viruses are competing against each other in effect. But the, the virulence one or the lethality one is more of a random effect. It's basically a lottery. So when a virus emerges that's more transmissible, whether it's more virulent or less virulent is almost a random effect. Yeah. And that's, that, that's not the lottery I want to be doing any time. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know you don't like commenting on the, how individual countries have done or anything like that, but at least in Europe in general, could we have done more to save lives? We have an unnecessary death toll. If you, if you ask any healthcare worker through their career or anyone dealing with any crisis and you say, looking back, could you have saved more lives? The, the, question, the answer always is yes. Uh, the, the answer is always yes. It doesn't matter what, what crisis you go through. Uh, the, and that's why we have to kind of learn the lessons uh, from that. I mean, there was certainly, from a European perspective, that that lack of integration of a comprehensive plan across that, the, the continent as such and the differences in, in, in measures, I think was confusing for people. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but each country was sort of uh, uh, trying to do the best they could with the health system they had. Some countries had a much stronger health system. They had lots of ICU beds, so they could absorb the pressure of an increasing epidemic wave better than a country that had very little uh, in terms of extra capacity in the health system. So countries managed it very differently. There was a sociocultural aspect to it. There was a political aspect to it. And those issues drove policymaking as much as science. And that's one of the issues we have, is what's driving policymakers to make decisions? 
And there's a lot more driving those decisions, and correctly so, than purely uh, scientific uh, considerations. Yeah. Are you are you surprised or even astonished at the level of misinformation or disinformation that's been going around? It still is going around. I mean, perhaps at the very start of the pandemic, you could forgive people for you know not being certain about something that was new. But I think we kind of know most of the main features of this virus and how to treat it and how to vaccinate it against it. And yet, relentlessly, this kind of false information has been pumped out. It really mm -hmm. is a big challenge, isn't it, for any future pandemic, too? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think <laughs> being from Ireland and the valleys of the squinting windows, misinformation is, is a weapon. <laughs> and it's been used mm -hmm. at all levels in all societies. Yeah. This is not new. Uh, you know, whispering tongues and people uh, speaking untruths and, uh, is, is not new. It's, it's part of the human condition. Yeah. Uh, the issue now is the platforms to do that on uh, have just exploded. But more importantly, what worries me more, I, 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 people who have doubts and people who have questions, people who have hesitancy about vaccines, people who want to ask hard questions of policymakers and of scientists, they should. And there should be that openness. We are accountable to citizens as scientists. We're accountable to citizens as policymakers. And you, Paul, and other journalists, your job is to hold us to account for what we're saying and what we're doing. That's healthy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's when that becomes a dysfunctional process, when that's manipulated for political reasons, as we saw in this pandemic, there was tremendous populist mismanagement of information uh, and I think that's, that, that's one side. And then there's the, just the general infosphere we live in and the way social media and conspiracy theories grow. And, 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 and we have to deal with those two issues. But just to say that this is a social media issue and it's just because people have lost the run of themselves on social media, for me, that's not the bigger problem. Yeah. The bigger issue for me is the political, willful political information of life-saving public health information. That, that to me, that to me is, is much more uh, astonishing, shocking, uh, and revolting, really. And uh, no, we have to work on both, we have to work, yeah. work on both sides of that equation. Uh, I'm not one for suppression of, of you know, I, I've worked in so many countries where the suppression of free speech and free thought is part of the way in which so many people that I've worked with in the last 30 years have been oppressed. So this, I'm not, and I would never attack the messenger, even if the message is not one I want to hear. But we in the health community, we in the social uh, sphere, we need to get much better at getting good information to people. Rather than complain about the misinformation, we have to get much better and get much more focused on giving people the information they need and allowing people to to find that information quickly. And, we're, you know, you can't stand on the sidelines and complain about the misinformation. It says, isn't it terrible what these people are saying? So I think we've learned a big lesson. We have got to engage, and we've got to engage with misinformation. We've got to get better at our own messaging. And that's a huge part of what we're trying to do here with the infodemic projects that we have. But on the other side, there's another intractable issue that I don't know how to deal with, and that is the political, the use, the weaponization of, of disinformation and misinformation for political purposes. And I don't know, quite frankly, Paul, how do we deal with that? Sure, yeah, that's interesting. Obviously, you make your own contribution to communications. I mean, you become a, a dab hand at, at some very choice expressions that I'm sure you're tired repeating, you know, telling us to test, test, test again and how speed trumps perfection. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, these are skills you also picked up in, in Tupperkuri as well along the way, were they? Or a little bit of training in-house in Geneva? It certainly wasn't my medical training. No, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's Irish cultural training. You know, uh, it's, uh, there's something, and I know it's a huge generalisation, but there's something about the society uh, we come from, from. And, you know, we spend so much of the last two or three generations feeling inferior to everybody else. But there, we have a few superpowers, I think, as, as a nation. And I think that ability to tell a story, the ability to... It's, it, you know, the, the spoken word is cherished in Ireland. It's always been valued. The, the written word has always been valued. That's why radio is still such a popular platform in Ireland. We like to hear other people speak. And we learn in, in, in the extended families we grew up in that that ability to communicate is really valued and sought after. And it's, 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 it's rewarded. 
uh, in kids, that, that capacity. Uh, uh, and, um, and I think that's something we have and we should be proud of as a culture. Uh, I, I do remember going into a huge meeting many, many years ago uh, in the United States and been absolutely freaked out. There was like 2,000 people at this American Academy of Sciences, and I was a young uh, epidemiologist sent over from WHO, and I, I nearly ran the other way when I opened the door and looked at this place. It was like the O2. Yeah. And uh, I remember Richard Cash, a professor at Harvard, was there, and I knew him. He was a mentor of mine, and he just grabbed me by, by, by the hand. And he said, Mike, you'll be okay. He said, you're Irish. Just tell them a story. <laughs> you know? And, it's as and it, kind of, it relaxed me, and I thought, yeah, I just get up there and I'll tell that story. Yeah. And, and I think that's why, rather than trying to communicate complexity by complex speaking, it never works. The, the trick is to try and not, not, and I think this is something that's really important, is, is not to oversimplify, not to dumb things down, not to treat intelligent people as if you're their superior, but to try and work to, to interpret the science in a way that you can communicate that in a way that's relevant and meaningful and, 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 and immediate for the person listening. And I think that's, I honestly think that's something that, that we as Irish people within our culture uh, do particularly well. Yeah. Tell me this, um, how would you rate your own organization's performance during this? Um, was there, would you say, would you point to one high point and maybe one failing or source of disappointment? <laughs> Highs and lows. No, it's 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 not. I mean, it's been a roller coaster ride. And and, and we we're saying before we came on, but we're not just dealing with COVID. We have Afghanistan. We have Tigray. We have some Haiti. The emergencies program deals with Yemen, Syria, and other and other situations. So, COVID is happening in the context of a really fragile and conflict affected uh, world right now. So, we're used to pressure in our program. We're, we're used to being under pressure, and that's what we're here. That's what we're paid for do, to do, uh, and we're paid to absorb uh, that pressure, and we're trained. Uh, you don't ask a, f a fireman or a policeman or a scuba diver, you know, is your job stressful? Of course it is. But if you're trained to do your job properly, you can do it safely, and you can do it with minimum stress. Uh, I, I think not so much stress, a lot of fatigue, a lot of frustration, quite frankly, but at times having to deal with politically motivated attacks uh, on the organization, on individuals in the organizations, that, that was really difficult. You know, I mean, I remember at one point Fox News had a picture of me up and all kinds of weird sort of images with sort of this man is coming to take your children away. I mean, it was being, you know, lampooned. And that's not upsetting. You laugh at it and then you think, oh, Lord, you know, is that is that... People believe that, yeah. You know, people yeah. believe that. And uh, so I think that's, that was the most uh, difficult part of the whole thing. Not, the, not the, the confusing science at the beginning, not the pressure to understand what was going on, not the need to bring the world together around science and research. That, that was, was hard and we didn't have enough resources to do it. Yeah. The hardest yeah. thing for me was, was the politics of it was just insane. It was absolutely insane. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, Dr. Tedros was attacked so many times. And, and I often thought to myself quietly, if he wasn't uh, a man of, a person from the South, would he have got such, I often thought to myself, would he have got such abuse? Would he have been attacked so much if we had the classic middle-aged white male running the organization, you know? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I just couldn't, maybe, maybe I've just been living in a, in a scientific and humanitarian world uh, of do-gooders, but uh, that was the most difficult. Yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah. no response is perfect and no organization is perfect. WHO is a UN organization. We operate on behalf of 194 member states. When you say, ask me a question, how did WHO do? I'd say WHO is 194 member states. Yeah. That's what WHO is. WHO is not me. I, I'm part of a secretariat. We provide services. You know, we we work for the organisation. We're the we're the green keepers on the on the golf course. Uh, we're the caddies. We're the ones that make the system work. But the members of the organisation are the the member states. And you know, we've seen um, we've seen real difficulties in getting member states to come together and actually do the things that we need to do in terms of equity. Yeah. So yeah. no, we don't get uh, high scores. I also was very frustrated, uh, I'll be very honest with you, in February uh, 2020, February and March, 
because we declared a, a public health emergency of international concern, a global public health emergency at the end of January. Mm. And it was the highest level of alert we can do under international law. And there was radio silence. It was like as if nothing had happened. And we just kept talking and, and doing press conferences right the way through February, almost every day, screaming about this. And yet it was kind of people standing at the top of the mountain looking down at the flood and saying, isn't that terrible, but never realising that the floodwaters were going to rise up and get them. Mm. And, and I must say, that was really disappointing for me. That, that, and it's something we need to think about in the future, is, is, is when those alerts go on, and when uh, we get to a point where we're, 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 we're announcing a, a global emergency, you know, is the world going to react more quickly? Uh, to that. That was, that was very frustrating. Right. I mean, I get what you say about uh, the political aspect of it, and I understand if you've got almost 200 members in your club that it's very hard to get a consensus, and there's, but there's bound to be some politics in that. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, just looking at it from Ireland and following this very closely, one thing I couldn't understand was, you know, this is obviously been a disaster for the world. It's cost massive mm -hmm. amounts, of, millions of people. Don't. It's very important to understand where it started and how it started. Now, you have been accused of being reluctant to, to uh, perhaps stand up to China about the origins. Um, there seems to be a, a willingness, perhaps for good reasons, I'm not qualified, but among the scientific community to say, yes, it definitely came from an animal, uh, and yet no intermediate animal has been f found. You know, from my standpoint, you say, well, one of the world's leading virology labs is in Wuhan, and the epidemic started in Wuhan. That seems to uh, suggest that further investigation is needed. China has been very reluctant to, uh, to allow access to records and so on. You, you know, you had an investigation, but, you know, you were, the people were accompanied by officials. You know, there have been the various other allegations about conflicts of, alleged conflicts of interest and so on. Um, talk of scientists who, in China who were involved falling ill and even dying and so on. On the face of it, it seems to me, as a completely unqualified person, that there's a plausible case for investigating as much as possible the possibility that this virus came accidentally from a lab in China. And yet, we don't seem to be any closer to, to, to getting any certainty on that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And we've, well, I've certainly said it, Dr. Tedros has said it many times, that the, the lab hypothesis is still there on the table. We need yeah, to be very so. careful with the confirmatory bias of, uh, you know, because there's a lab in a, in a city, therefore that must be the source. That, 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 that's, that's, that's an observation that needs to be investigated. And it's not, that's circumstantial evidence. And uh, we all... Uh, are well aware of how circumstantial evidence leads to wrongful conviction in so many uh, cases without the corroboratory evidence that should go with that. So mm. it's not an it's not an idiotic observation. Uh, it's an important observation, and it needs to be uh, further investigated. But when we look at it in terms of phylogenetics, when we look at the genetics of the thing, when we look at the at at, at the science of this. It is still much more likely than not that this virus emerged in an intermediate host. Uh, it took years to get the source of other infections. We still don't fully understand intermediate hosts in Ebola. We understand the origins in bats, but we don't know what the full range of intermediate hosts are. We don't understand. It took us many, many months, over a year to understand, more than a year, to, to understand the origin of MERS. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's, it is a needle in a haystack thing if the signal goes off. The problem is when, when, when the signal is on and the disease transmits into humans, then you can potentially find that. Uh, and if that signal is then off, if the disease is not circulating in those wild animals or those farmed animals anymore, you might not necessarily find it. You should be able to find it. You can do serology and many other things. And for that, you need large-scale studies in the field. And that's a frustrating thing. That could be in China, that could be in the Mekong, that could be elsewhere. But you start where the virus started in humans, and that's in Wuhan and that's Hubei province. Mm -hmm surrounding provinces, and you go out in concentric circles from that. But it's still on a purely scientific basis. Uh, and looking at, the, at the, the, the viral sequences, looking at the evolutionary uh, sort of genetics of it, it's still much more likely that this was a natural origin than an origin in a laboratory. But it doesn't, you cannot then say because of that, there's 
zero likelihood that this came from a laboratory because of the observation you just made. And therefore, you need to go back and look at the laboratory issues as well. You need to look at both. What I'm fearful of at the moment, quite honestly, Paul, is that if we're now in a difficult, it's been a difficult political time in, 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 in moving forward on this, what I don't want is that the trail goes completely cold on the animal-human side as we fight over the lab side. And in other words, the, 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 the tensions around the laboratory hypothesis, which have a huge political component, they have a science component, and there is a hypothesis that is yeah. valid and relevant within that, but the politicization of that has actually hampered our capacity to go and look for the animal source, if you, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So we end up with the politicization of a relevant issue, which is now blocking, in many ways, our ability to go after the virus. Because access we, won't be allowed. Uh, well, each sovereign state can invite WHO in or not. We don't have the power to go into a sovereign state and yeah. investigate anything. I can't come to Ireland today and investigate an outbreak without an invitation of, of the government. Yeah. The first uh, team that went uh, gained a huge amount of information. There was a whole series of studies that were advised to be planned. We understand that uh, Chinese scientists are carrying out uh, at least some of those studies. Further studies are going to be needed. We're, uh, I'm going to have a lovely week this week, Paul, because I think we've had over 600 applications or four for our uh, strategic, our scientific advisory group at Origins. We, we, what we're trying to do now is really bring this into a much more formal process where we can have a selection of scientists from all over the world who we can work with on origins in general for the future uh, and who can look at all this data now again. Uh, but you're right, this tension, and, and again, the issue of, uh, you'll have to go and ask our colleagues in, in China, uh, there are two reasons why someone may restrict your ability to investigate something. One is that uh, they're, they're hiding something, and the other is they're just very annoyed at the way the whole process is working politically. They're worried about reputation, and it becomes a, a piece in a political game. Mm. Uh, and you, you can answer me which of those two things mm. are, are, are the truth. I can't tell you, mm. because they're, those two forces are at play. Um, and, uh, you know, we have been frustrated. I've expressed my frustration in the past. Um, I always, I've spent my life in the field going after viruses and going after their origins. Um, and, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, and it should be happening. Uh, and we need, to see, we need to see it done with greater speed and greater comprehensiveness. And that's what we keep saying. Um, but again, we, we're not a police force. We cannot yeah. just uh, land in a country and do what we like. And on balance, do you think we'll ever find out what caused this? I believe we will, because I believe yeah. we've done it for other pathogens. I believe, I believe we will. I hope we will. And we do yeah. need to. Okay. Because as long yeah. as that source is not found, there's always the chance this could ignite yeah. again. And yeah. what we have is a, a virus in the animal kingdom somewhere, which is clearly adapted to human transmission. And that may continue to evolve in, that, in those animals. And it could re-enter the human population sure. with a new strain at any time. So it's not just a a nice uh, academic thought. It's, a, it's an important public health imperative that we do. Right. Um, can I ask you, the, the WHO has been prominent in calling for a moratorium on, on the administration of booster shots in developed countries um, so that the available supplies of vaccine can be used around the world to give people who can't get access to doses uh, at least a first shot, you know. Um, can I ask you, Ar Ireland and other wealthy countries have started rolling out boosters in their population anyway. Um, are you disappointed with this approach? Um, I think uh, countries like Ireland and, and a number of others have really, in a sense, started to give a third dose to particularly vulnerable groups who may not have developed a, a full immune response or whose immune response may be waning. Um, and if, if their immune response is waning, the clinical consequences of that are very severe for them. Uh, that's not the same as booster six shots in the general population. They're different so, things. Can you uh, live with that then? Absolutely. No, I, I mean, uh, it's, 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 you know, we're, we're first and foremost physicians. Well, what, and, and again, this com there, there's a false comparison in the sense of saying uh, booster shots, absolutely no booster shots because we want to put all the vaccine into, into equity. Uh, yeah, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. But we want... What we were saying is 
we know that two doses of vaccine, which has been proven in the Northern Hemisphere, is life-saving. And we've seen the decoupling of the epidemic curves from the death curves. Go yeah. and look at it. The number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths has fallen off dramatically in countries that have got high vaccination levels. And that's the benefit of two doses of vaccine. But as we speak in Asia, given the hours they are ahead, there are doctors and nurses going to work today in COVID wards who haven't had a single dose of vaccine. Now, is that fair? No. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's ridiculous in ethical terms. It's ridiculous in epidemiologic terms. Uh, and, and it's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. That doesn't preclude countries in, in Ireland making policy decisions to give a third dose of vaccine to particularly vulnerable individuals who could suffer severe clinical consequences if they were to develop the disease again. And this gives them extra protection. Uh, and Why what about, can I ask you, then what about giving the vaccine to children who, for whom, who are very marginal risk of mm -hmm. harm, as we well, are think that, to people uh, aged of 12 to... Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I don't have an issue with countries having uh, given the vaccines to the 12 to 19-year-olds. It's about education. There are more factors there than purely um, clinical factors. There are social factors and educational factors that need to be taken into account when making those policies. So, you know, in, in life, science doesn't equal policy. You put science with the social, cultural, and economic issues that go with that, and from that comes policy. I have no issue with that. What our issue has been that each and every time we've gone through this, we had first rollout in adults, right? And we said, we need more vaccine equity. It didn't happen. And then it rolls to 12 to 19-year-olds. And we accept that and we move on. And we say, we need more vaccine for the people who have none. And it doesn't happen. And now we're on to boosters. And we're saying we need vaccine for people who have zero vaccines. Uh, uh, and we're Yeah, but on, on the other hand, you're, I'm inviting you to say, well, uh, we don't need, Western countries don't need to give vaccines to 12 to 19 year olds and, and even but it's not booster about shots. And, but you're, exactly. you're declining the, the opportunity to, to say, well, actually, that would be a good idea. You're saying, well, I'm, I, I have no problem with that. So on the specific, on the generality, as my point is, Generally, you're pleading is, vaccine no inequity, but on specifics, you're saying, well, actually, we don't have a problem with that. Is, is there's there not a contradiction vaccine, there? There's enough no, there isn't, because there's enough yeah. vaccine right now. If countries wanted to shift production, if the manufacturers prioritise the COVAX initiative, yeah. if countries were to shift their excess vaccines that they have already in contracts, yeah. some countries have four to five times the amount of vaccine they will ever need already under contract. This Still. is the problem. Still. The, we have, yes, still. Yeah. So we have, yeah. we have more vaccines than we need right now. And if we just shift, and it's not about shifting them away, it's shifting them to the people who really need them while maintaining priorities. Surely we can do both things, right? Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that 12 to 19 year olds should not be vaccinated, right? I'm not going to say that to you. What I'm saying to you is we need to make sure that those people on this planet, particularly people who have high risk and vulnerability and health workers, in low-income countries, I mean, when you when you look at the data, uh, if you go to the high-income countries, we've issued 100, 119 vaccines per 100 people have been given, right? Total population. Yeah. If you go to low-income countries, that's 2.9 doses per 100 people. 2.9 doses per 100 people. That's about, you know, it, it, it's, it's a ridiculously low number of people in low-income countries that have been, that have been covered. And, and, and we have the production capacity we have the vaccines now and the production, if we look out to, to the next six months, we can get the, we should be able to get the 40% coverage everywhere in the world by the end of the year and 70% coverage by the middle of next year. And we can do that within existing production plans. We can do that if countries shift some of their vaccine orders to the COVAX initiative uh, or if we get uh, manufacturers prioritising the COVAX initiative for those vaccines. And it's not yeah. charity. Those vaccines have been purchased, they're being bought. So uh, I, I, I cannot see for why we cannot do both. I don't see how we cannot do both. Uh, and uh, and uh, to me, it's, uh, I've said it before, this is like handing out, you know, two, two life jackets, uh, an extra life jacket to people who already have one, while we're letting people who have no life jacket to drown. That, that is essentially it. Uh, is, is two life jackets better than one? Probably. Yeah. Until, you comp until you have that second life jacket and you look at someone that has none. And, and that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, my President Michael D. Higgins said this week that Africa had been failed by Europe in not getting a fair share in vaccines. It sounds like you're agree you would agree with him.
uh, failed by everybody. And 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 and, and but Africa. I mean, there there's some great initiatives at the at, from the African Union. Africa wants to get into production. There's a technology transfer hub in South Africa now. Africa is yeah. organizing itself much more effectively. So this isn't about charity. This is not only about charity. This is not only about solidarity. It's also about making sure that we can reduce transmission rates in other countries so we don't end up with another variant coming back and biting us in six months' time. So uh, there's, a, there's an enlightened self-interest in trying to use vaccines around the world in a way that we can suppress transmission, you know? Oh, don't say six months' time, please. <laughs> Listen, we have a packed audience here. I'm only joking. They're not packed. They're socially distanced. And I'm sure many of them would like to, uh, to ask a question. So I'm going to um, ask if anyone would like to ask a question. I hope I'm not catching you by surprise. Anyone want to put up their hand? Um, a woman in the, in the middle there. We're going to get a microphone to you there. I'm not sure, Mike, can you see the... You can only see me, is it? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm in was, the cheap seats, Paul. I'm in the cheap there seats. Was, there was a time last year when I, uh, in the daily conference, I used to follow Mike's lack of a haircut. His hair, you got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then one day he sort of turned up as a skinhead, really, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you went from one extreme to the other when yeah, the uh, lockdown I finished. The, I had the trainee barber that day. And unfortunately, you know, it, those old, older people, we say, I'll have a, num a number four and number three on the side. Unfortunately, the new vernacular, it's measured in millimetres, so the young... <laughs> <laughs> so I was, yeah. I was taught by a generational faux pas, right? <laughs> OK, we've question there. Yeah. Uh, Dr Ryan, thanks very much. Uh, who do we write to for the COV to promote the COVAX programme? Who d how do we <coughs> get on board with this if we... I'm fortunate, I'm doubly vaccinated, or I've had the two vaccines. How, how do we start to generate social media around this for good? How do we how do we push the vaccine equity forward? Um, great question. The UN General Assembly is next week. There's a big vaccine summit there. So, I mean, uh, Ireland is going to be represented there uh, as well. I, and again, Ireland has announced uh, contributions to, uh, to COVAX, which is, is fantastic. Um, Ireland, Ireland as a country has always been, had a humanitarian heart. Uh, the work our peacekeepers done, the work our, our do, the work our NGOs do abroad, and and the work that Irish Aid does with Irish taxpayers' money has done tremendous good around the world. And I think Ireland should be leading on the vaccine equity issue. And I'm really pleased that uh, uh, President Higgins has always been a, a hero to me, uh, is championing the idea of moving and shifting vaccines to the south. So it's everybody uh, writing. It, it, it's uh, it's it's to show that we we reassure. There's almost an, an, an issue here, too, of giving permission. Politicians are very, very fearful. And you see this with the whole public health and social measures of doing anything that they will subsequently be blamed for because they have taken the focus away from protecting their own population. Because someone in Botswana or someone in Central African Republic doesn't have a vote in the next election of any country in the industrial north. Uh, and I think around the world, politicians in the North need to be given permission by their citizens to share. There needs to be, and that's a strange thing, it's not about complaining or pressuring, it's more about permission. We want you to share, rather than anti terrible people for not sharing. No one reacts to that. We need to give them permission, uh, collectively, that this is the right thing to do. Another question there? I see somebody's hand up. Oh, don't be shy. We had lots of questions earlier on. There you go. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. I'm just wondering about the logistics of distributing vaccines to countries which may have poorer infrastructure and less resources. So, I mean, in Europe, in the wealthier countries, they've been frozen, we've had special freezers, and they've been refrigerated, and we've carriers, and they shouldn't be shaken. And, you know, the vaccines themselves have had stability issues, which we have managed to deal with. But is that going to be a logistical problem in, in countries which may not have the same resources? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Uh, yes and no. Uh, we've, um, in many ways, uh, countries in the industrial north have had very little experience in vaccinating adults uh, or people who are not children under five. 
uh, historically it's been banned. and congratulations in Ireland I I, I think you've uh, you've done uh, unbelievably uh, well in terms of, uh, of, of of vaccinating uh, people in Ireland I, I you know put uh, millions of vaccines out there got over 70 percent coverage it's a tour de force Ireland is one of the the most vaccinated countries in the world and it's a great credit to the health workers in Ireland and to the system that was able to deliver it and to people's acceptance and demand for that uh, that, that vaccine and you've outlined some of the issues um, the uh, you know I, 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 I've been involved in vaccination campaigns in Pakistan and other places in India you think you, you, in one day yeah, uh, yesterday I think uh, India vaccinated 22.7 million people in a day uh, so there's huge capacity. I've seen it with yellow fever in Brazil and other places. Uh, we've been working for a year now with all of the countries in the COVAX initiative, preparing them from. Each country had to develop a national vaccine development plan. They don't get vaccines unless we can demonstrate the cold chain that they need for that vaccine. We've sent technicians, engineers and others to help beef up. And this is working with our colleagues in UNICEF and in Gavi. It's not just WHO uh, at all. And working with NGOs, working with many of the NGO community in, in, communities in the humanitarian countries and increasing. There are some countries that aren't quite ready. The biggest problem these countries have, and I think you'd appreciate it as the, as the, as the uh, person who answered that question, because I suspect you're involved in healthcare delivery. Imagine if you were trying to plan an immunization campaign where no one could tell you when you were going to get the vaccine. No one would tell you how much you were going to get. Uh, how can you plan a campaign? How can you make appointments? How can you bring communities for vaccination if you don't know when you're going to get the vaccine? And then when you do get the vaccine, it's close to an expiry date because uh, it's been that long getting there. So uh, there are issues, uh, but we think we've mitigated most of them. And, and, uh, and countries, the, the issue is not distribution and absorption. Actually, there are issues. The issue is vaccine access. The issue is availability of vaccine to these countries, uh, not the absorption capacity of those countries. Having said that, there are countries like now, like Afghanistan and Myanmar and others, who are delivering vaccines at community level, will all, always present a problem. We've built a, a humanitarian buffer within the overall COVAX facility, and the humanitarian buffer is managed by the humanitarian agencies so that we will be able to get to people that are beyond government access in places like Syria and other places. So we've, we've built in contingencies for NGO and other humanitarian organization-led vaccination campaigns in places where governments don't have the logistics or the access or the control to be able to deliver vaccines. So uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, and you, you know that you know it's not about vaccines, it's about vaccination. And between vaccine and vaccination, there's a tremendous amount of innovation and a tremendous amount of preparation and huge amounts of planning and micro planning and sweat and tears to get that done. Uh, and we believe we can do that. And could, can you imagine if we can do that and we can bring the whole world up to some kind of equity? What an achievement that would be uh, if we could do that. And we would look back on this pandemic and the tragedy it's caused, the undoubted tragedy it's caused, but at least come out of it saying we were fair. Uh, we managed to deliver these precious uh, and, and vital uh, scientific innovations to everybody who needed it on the planet within the, 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 a given period of time. I think that that will set us up for building back better. Uh, if we end up looking back at this pandemic in three or four years' time, and we, the only thing we can see is the inequity that was generated by that pandemic, then I think it will be a regret. I think it's also the case that the, of course, the Pfizer vaccine, the, the storage requirements are not as onerous as they were Yes. when it was first developed. So yeah. you don't need that minus 70 degrees uh, that we originally thought we, we, we mm -hmm. needed. So that opens up some more options, I suppose. Or, or, is, or is it all about AstraZeneca uh, for many of these countries? No, no, it's, it's, it, it's, Makes, uh, you're right. Uh, and even when the vaccine comes out of that, it can be kept for a number of days in a normal mm -hmm. situation as well. And uh, I, I could share, I wish I could share my screen and show you some of the photos of some of the vaccination teams in some of yeah. the country. Uh, uh, there, there have been massive efforts. Just, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind if the vaccine is made available, it will get used, right? The, I have no doubt that the, the will is there to, to utilize those vaccine doses. I'm more concerned about vaccine hesitancy than I would be about vaccine logistics. 
anywhere in the world. Anyone else with a question? Coming towards, towards the end of our time here. I mean, just to maybe finish on a positive note, can I make the case for what the world has done? I mean, they have developed, we have developed a vaccine in record time. At least one of those vaccines has been made at co available at cost price um, on a non-profit sort of a basis. Um, and after some initial difficulties, it's being distributed at an accelerating rate, I think, you know. So maybe, you know, it's not that we're not doing it, it's just we haven't got to the parts of the world yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're, I understand your impatience, but we are getting there. Is, is it not, not fair? Or are there still big log jams that you think could be swept away very easily? Well, that kind of reminds me in, uh, of, uh, of Donkey and Shrek. Are we there yet? You know, yeah. uh, any anyway, you know, kids. Uh, yep. um, I, I'm impatient and frustrated, but I accept your premise that we're all trying to get that job done. And I don't mm. believe there are, you know, there, there are bad actors in that per se. It's just everyone's got to put the focus on it or it won't happen. And you're right. We've developed, you know, we, I mean, it was incredible. By, you know, we, the sequences were put online on the, I think, the 10th, 11th of January. We had lab assays by the 14th of January. We, we, had, we were issuing contracts to manufacturers by the 23rd of January. We're shipping uh, diagnostics all over the world by, the, uh, by the, the, the 4th of February. I mean, how long did it take us to develop diagnostics for HIV and for other diseases? Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Uh, some of the stuff that's been done, but the, and that's great. And scientific innovation and community resilience and the, the courage and bravery that communities have shown around the world the courage and bravery that health workers have shown around the world, the way in which health systems have adapted and really tried their best to save lives is, is there are many hero stories. But we've also seen how our health systems are being overgeared all the time, you know, always on the edge of collapse. And, 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 and we've underinvested in our healthcare system and resilience. We've underinvested in our preparedness. We've underinvested, as you spoke about, about managing misinformation in, in our communities. Um, and uh, we've also seen that the, the inequities buried and built into our society. The fact is that people with underlying conditions, people from lower socioeconomic groups, people without access to healthcare, not just for COVID, but for 20 years previously, they're the ones who die. This virus... Yeah didn't do all the killing. In fact, this virus did little, a little enough of the killing in this pandemic. What did most of the killing is the fact that many, many millions of people are living with underlying conditions that aren't managed properly or don't have proper access to health care. They can't get oxygen in the healthcare system. That's what's killing people. So we do need to look at that. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pathological optimist, Paul, like you. I want to be optimistic. But this is a moment where we have to stop and think. You know, do we have the healthcare system and prevention systems that we need? Do we have the equity that we need? Uh, and are we going to be ready for the next one whenever it occurs? And do we realize how we've mismanaged the biome, how we've mismanaged our planet, uh, and how we need to take stock now? And I'm not just talking about health equity, I'm talking about social equity, uh, uh, climate justice, health justice, and social justice have to come together, that you cannot separate them anymore. You cannot separate poor health outcomes from social inequities. You can't separate the impact of climate change from social inequities and the impact, the differential impact climate stress and change is going to have on poor communities. And we can't have these siloed arguments anymore. I want to be hopeful because I actually think there's a new generation of young people who want to solve those problems. Uh, and I want to be that hopeful person. I am a total optimist, and I think we can do it. Because if the innovation you spoke about so rightly, Paul, if we can develop a vaccine in the time we did, you know, if we can do that collectively and create the kind of innovation we've created around this pandemic, if we can do that in, in social equity and inclusion, if we can do that in climate, uh, in, in climate management, uh, then we'll have a better planet for, for the future. So I want to be hopeful, but I'm also deeply impatient about the vaccine equity issue right now. Okay, um, on that very eloquent note, I think we'll say thank you very much, Mike. Um, we hope maybe, perhaps maybe in a year's time, you might be here in person in Galway. We, we might be looking back on this pandemic uh, as an item that's in the past. But for now, we are in the middle of 
of it. And you are very much in the throes of it. And I'd just like to invite everybody to say thank you. What a fantastic ending to our first thought program for this year. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry you couldn't be with us in person. It would have been lovely to have you here. But thank you so much for being with us virtually. And it's a truism that international organizations are only as good as their members. It's a point that you made. But every now and again, somebody with passion, intelligence, eloquence, and common sense appears and manages to tick every single box that's needed at a time of crisis. And Mike Ryan is one of those people. We have every reason to be extremely grateful to him. Uh, I also want to thank Paul Cullen, who has done two gigs for us today and who is so well informed about everything. He's a bit scary, actually. I would like to go up <laughs> against him. He's going to ask friends, hard eh? questions. Um, for those of you who uh, missed other events or who have friends who want to see Mike Ryan, all of these uh, sessions will be on the festival YouTube channel as and from tomorrow. There were three amazing sessions directly relating to the pandemic today. Professor Abe Pandit this morning, uh, Theresa Lam, one of the inventors of AstraZeneca uh, this afternoon, and now finishing brilliantly with Dr. Mike Ryan. So thank you all. Enjoy the last night of the festival. Uh, and hopefully we will see you next July for a fully organized program yet again when all this is gone due to the efforts of people like Dr. Mike Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.